Good afternoon and welcome to today's live webinar on engineering skills for humanitarian needs. I'm Julia Ratcliffe, a member of the iStructee's Humanitarian and International Development Panel, introducing this webinar on behalf of the institution. I'm here representing the iStructee's Humanitarian and International Development Panel. It was formed in 2017 by our chair, Tom Newby, and has members based across four continents, some who work as engineering professionals for NGOs and international development organizations, and others within commercial engineering practices. The panel has published a series of guides and case studies to help members understand the unique challenges of working in a development context. And these are all available through the panel's webpage. You can also send questions to the panel from this area. In the new year, we're intending to, to launch a, a competencies framework that follows the format of the institution's IPD. And this will further expand on this guidance, supporting professionals to develop the range of skills and knowledge to work effectively in this sector. The institution's flagship awards program, the Structural Awards, has an annual ceremony that the world is the world's largest event dedicated to structural engineering. It celebrates the structural engineer's unique role in the built environment as innovative and creative problem solvers and collaborators. The iStructD is committed to connecting engineers from all over the world, especially now with the institution's commitment to tackling the climate emergency. The Structural Awards would have taken place this evening. Instead, this afternoon, we're showcasing the work of Red R, which has been supported through the awards over many, many years. The institution is proud to be a patron supporter of Red R, who, as many of you know, carries out important work training aid workers and building local capacity in vital technical skills to respond to and prepare for disasters and support sustainable development worldwide. The speakers will talk about Red R and their experiences of working in the humanitarian sector, as well as the skills they've gained both professionally and personally. I'm delighted to hand over to Joe Dusserano. CEO of Red R UK, who will chair this webinar. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, Julia. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks very much to iStruct T for their support all through these years. Um, it's been amazing to be part of that. For me, a short time as my, I've been at Red R only since March 2019. Um, but obviously, as you said, for many, many years. So thank you very much for that. So as Julia said, we're going to basically present a bit about Red R, um, and I will also kind of incorporate or weave my background into the links in engineering skills for humanitarian needs. So that's our new name or our relatively new name. It's actually Register of Engineers for Disaster Relief. Um, and that's where it was born 40 years ago by Peter Guthrie uh, when he was working with the Vietnamese boat people. So we've been around for 40 years. It's our birthday this year. So that's a, a pretty big, uh, pretty big event and something I'll talk about a bit more later. So, as I said, we're a humanitarian charity. We we are working mostly at the moment in capacity building and working with both people and organizations. So it says people here, but actually we work with organizations as well to make them more effective and more efficient uh, to respond to emergencies and to serve affected communities better. Um, we have the wonderful, wonderful benefit of having uh, HRH, the Princess Royal, as our president. And she is, as you know, the hardest working royal. So it's brilliant to have her as part of the Red R family. So here's some facts and figures for you and some nice statistics and a lovely infographic. Um, so in 2019, as it says there, we've built over four, the capacity of over 4,000 people in 35 countries. This year, we're doing pretty well as well. I'll explain a bit more about that later. We're quite small, actually. We're 25 members of staff, more or less, spread, spread around London, Khartoum and Amman. Um, and we're what's called an HPASS qualified um, uh, organization, meaning that we, our training, our capacity development initiatives meet a high standard set by the HPASS quality standards. Um, so we're really, really proud of that. And we are also on the steering committee for that. So that's one of the ways that we contribute to the system is by actually providing uh, quality capacity building to those who need it. 
Um, our work, hopefully, as you can see there, you know, over 80% of the people that we train are from national organisations. That is our kind of raison d'etre, as it were. Um, we want to really work within the localisation agenda and ensure that people actually located in the areas affected by emergencies are the ones that are skilled and able to manage their own, uh, own humanitarian response. So here are some of our flagship programmes. Um, Bridging the Gap is a personal favourite of mine, and that's in South Sudan. So we talk about capacity building, but it's not necessarily all about training. And some of it, it's about being a, a facilitator and a mediator. So Bridging the Gap is a, is a great example of that, where it brought together faith and non-faith-based actors in South Sudan. Um, traditionally in humanitarian response that has been quite a, a challenge and so this was great and actually there's a whole there's a second wave of that project that's going to happen very soon another area you see the africa catalyst and that's with royal academy of engineering funding um, and so we work alongside the feo the federation of african engineering organizations and we have done for a long while um, and currently working with them in uganda and we're looking at how we can support um, the Federation of African Engineering Organizations to be able to respond more effectively to humanitarian emergencies. Um, knowledge point, I was reading recently, and as I said, I've only been around since 2019. Um, knowledge point is has been around since the 1990s. I did not know at all. And You'll find often that in emergencies or guidance and you go, OK, yeah, that's great and brilliant. And I've got all this information about what I should do. But I've got this context that is really, really kind of specific. And I really, really need someone to answer that specific question. And that's what Knowledge Point is about. We have uh, engineering and humanitarian specialists who are there on the other end of Knowledge Point. You input a question and they'll come back to you and say, well, when I was working in X location at this emergency, we did that and someone else can come in and also answer your question. So it provides a really good uh, interactive way of support that is not just generic and actually it, it suits real, really for the context. One of the last things and one way we kind of work obviously um, is chiming with what the Institution of Structural Engineers is doing is working in climate change and disaster risk reduction. Um, we've got a couple of um, courses that are actually going to happen very, very soon, one in the Philippines and Bangladesh, and that is about working with organisations and people in disaster prone or areas that are really are severely affected, in this case, Philippines and Bangladesh, to to put climate change adaptation within their programs and disastrous reductions, so to make them more resilient in future. So you can see we're quite varied actually in, in what we do. Um, we have our strategy and we have three hubs, so three teams set up within Red Eye UK, one which is called Bridging the Gap, and that is after the Bridging the Gap project. And that is, as I said, that's about, you know, kind of bridging the skills gap and the capacity gaps. It's about facilitation, mediation, and about being an honest broker. And that's something that Red Eye does in the middle. Localization is all is all coming through from, there was a World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. Uh, within that, there was a, a, the Grand Bargain, which lots and lots of donors and, and uh, national governments signed up to saying actually what we want is that response is as local as possible as international as necessary and that's what we've been trying to do for many years as I said is that you know we want it to not be that a response is driven by you know by the UK or by America or by Western uh, countries but actually that it's the people involved in the locations that are there and they're the primary responses and the primary responders and they are able to respond so that's that's our localization hub and that's about trying to give uh, free or low cost training and capacity development to uh, local and national um, responders the technical hub that is about as it says there specialist technical expertise so you know we are register register of engineers for disaster relief we were born about a recognition that engineering was needed within humanitarian contexts and so this this hub is actually there about broadening those links and making and deepening them and saying actually we do have there's a way that red eye uk can work alongside uh, engineering companies and engineers and that they and that we can have a symbiotic relationship with the engineering industry in making um, the response better through both of those and, and merging them all together in if you know bridging the gap as it were uh, within those um 
So these are some of the organizations we work with. You can see a lot of familiar names up there. We, um, and that grows and grows. And, and um, we're very, very fortunate to have support of some of those donors in there and to work in, in kind of relationships with them. We had a long-term partnership with um, DFID, well, uh, uh, the what is it called now foreign commonwealth development office um and um we are looking forward to continue with that we also have our key supporters for so our patrons and our corporate partner partners of which the i strategy as you can see in the middle is one of those i want to tell you a bit more about those actually i mean we have patrons uh, who provide us with multi-year donations arab is one of those that's on there so thanks to arab we have corporate partner donations. We have graduate challenges. Atkins that's there, they have a graduate program and every year their graduates do some kind of challenge on behalf of Red R. It's brilliant and uh, they raise money for us and uh, get out and do some exciting things while they do it. Um, our supporters uh, form part of our Wear Red uh, campaign, which is takes place in March every year. And we generally have lots of fundraising and lots of cake baking and sponsorship and lots and lots of staff from around these organizations participate in that. Um, we also have like very much like iStractees, the charity partners. For example, yesterday I was with the the British Construction Industry Awards, and we are part of we are partner to them as well. So we have that kind of relationship. Um, in the part of the technical hub, hub going forward is is more as I said about deepening those ties, and it's looking at kind of joint bidding opportunities um, we have for example just worked alongside Arab and we'll be working with them in Bhutan on a project so that's something that's really exciting and that's coming up for us in um, in the future um, all of our key supporters and our patrons get invited along to our annual event with with Princess Anne which is great and she is a brilliant brilliant spokesperson for Red R and the institutions help us with a lot of um, practical support, which is also great. In return, what we can do for organizations, we do lunch and learns. Anita, who is, is, is on this call with us today, is one of the key staff who delivers that for us and also disaster relief workshops so it's not just a one-way street it is a two-way street we can deliver those kind of things for you and give organizations an idea of what it is to respond in a humanitarian uh, emergencies and if you're interested if you're out there we'll work for an organization please do drop us a line and we can we can have a chat so I said a bit earlier about our climate change and disaster risk reduction courses. So we are doing that in the Philippines and we got that in Bangladesh and you are able to sign up to those now um, and you can get more information about that on our website. We're also, and I said, you know, was earlier that we had been training a 4,000 people in 2019. Well, so far this year, and we're only halfway through our, our year, trained about two and a half thousand people that's because we've been doing COVID-19 training and we've completely switched from being face-to-face -face training you can imagine as an organization that does face-to-face -face training um, a COVID world is not quite amenable to that uh, we're fortunate to have been able to have convert a lot of courses to uh, an online format and are still delivering those up until the 19th of November so if you're interested in those again the information is on our website we have managing COVID-19 myths and rumors, managing stress during the COVID-19 pandemic, mental health and well-being in the workplace during COVID-19, risk communication, community engagement, gender and inclusion, training essentials, and, new, and, a, and a new course in remote management. And that's reflecting the fact that we are now in a COVID world and uh, remote management is something that is just uh, going to be more and more important. So if you look on our website, you can see about signing up to those. So now I want to talk a bit more about, it's quite niche actually this, before I worked at um, before I worked at Red R and I was a consultant before that, and then before that I worked for the Department of International Development or FCDO as it is now, and I worked on the portfolio for urban search and rescue. Um, and I worked on that since about 2005. And I'm very proud of being there to set up this relationship here with UK ISAR of the 15 fire and rescue services that deliver or deploy to uh, undertake um, urban search and rescue operations on behalf of the UK government. And you can see some nice pancaked buildings on the right-hand side. 
Um, you can also see there, which is the most always the most popular member of the team are the dogs. Um, and whilst there might be 60 or so, as we said, they're fire and rescue personnel, people from the NHS, so we have vets and structural engineers, which is why it's appropriate. It's always the dogs that are the most, most, most um, famous, shall we say, members of the team. So the search and rescue team, they deploy for a rough, roughly about 14 days. They need to get on the field in the in the affected area within 48 hours and then whilst they're there they operate for 24 7 in two locations operating what's called a heavy capability and that's to so that they can get through reinforced concrete to help save lives so as it says there we have um, structural engineers that are needed as part of that and I've worked alongside um, alongside UK ISAR for many years and they are still looking for structural engineers which is why this is very relevant to you guys now. Um, this is what the structural engineers are responsible for and I've given you a details there of Rob who is their deputy coordinator there so if this is a kind of thing you can see that you know this is the kind of capability that's needed you would then be able to sign up to UK ISAR they can then uh, work with you to prepare you you would work out how to get released from your from your job because as I said you'd need to get be in the you know we, we would mobilize you or the UK government would mobilize you within six hours of a response so that you can get to uh, get to the nearest airport and then you can get deployed overseas so if that and then they'll give you all the vaccinations and all the training you need if that's something that really interests you um, and this is as I said a very kind of a niche way to work within humanitarian emergencies then please do give Rob a call um, after this event um, and then you can see this after um, if you're playing this back afterwards you can pick out his details a bit more please don't contact me though please do contact Rob so that's that's a bit about the kind of a, a niche uh, engineering capability in uh, humanitarian response. Uh, as I said earlier, we are 40 this year and we are doing what's called the Big 4-0 Challenge. Um, as it says there, um, we remember the ALS Challenge where everyone did the Ice Bucket Challenge? Well, this is kind of similar, but what we want you to do is 40, 40 of something um, and then to get sponsorship for that and then ask four of your friends to do the same. And we want you to post a photo or a video of that to, uh, to Facebook or, or on Twitter and tag us in it and then um, pass it on so that others can do that. We've had some great uh, input so far. I flipped a pancake, which wasn't very spectacular. We've had a friend of mine, Chris, who swam 40 kilometers in the swimming pool, not in one day, over the course of 40 days and gave up alcohol for 40 days. Um, one of our trustees did 40,000 steps in a day and Richard, who is our transition programs transition director, has basically just been doing silly things of about 40 silly things and getting people to give us money. So it would be really, really nice if you could sign up to that. You can see the link below, justgiving.com forward slash campaign forward slash red R big four O. Um, so yeah, please do have a look at that. You can see all the details about that on our website or on um, our LinkedIn or Facebook page too. Okay, so if you want, if you like, if you like what you hear about Red R and you want to give to Red R today, this is just an easy way to do that. You can donate ten pounds by texting I struck E E to I say that properly I struck E to seven zero one nine one or by visiting easydonate.org forward slash I struck E. Um, so that would be gratefully appreciated if you would be able to donate today. So I'm going to move on now to introduce Andrew Lamb. Now, Andrew and I go back quite a long while. Um, Andrew uh, used to be a Red R member of staff uh, back in the early 2000s. And he also was a trustee for Red R up until quite recently. I first met, Red, uh, first met Andrew at an Essentials of Humanitarian Practice course, which was run by Red R in about 2005. So, and that that course is brilliant and it's brilliant for new people entering the um, humanitarian world So, and it still runs so available to you guys all today. So now over to Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present today. I'm really glad that the um, Institution of Structural Engineers is doing this and that Red R is able to help. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about 
um, what I have learned from, as an engineer working in the humanitarian sector. I'm an information systems electronics engineer, really. I did a couple of years of structural engineering, but um, very quickly got into humanitarian work when I um, actually was when I was an undergraduate, I, I actually started meeting Red R members who were supporting the Engineers Without Borders group that I joined. And, um, you know, I started doing some of the courses, the hands-on weekends and things that Red R still does today. And um, I heard about a job at Red R working as a fundraiser. And, and uh, Joe had just been emphasizing some of that, but I'll tell you what, if you want to get into, an, <laughs> into a humanitarian organization, fundraising is a good way to do it because you have to know everything about an organization if you're going to fundraise, and fundraise for it because you're going to get asked um, everything about the organization when you talk to people. So um, that was about um, uh, 2001 when I first came across Radar. So 19 years ago when I was um, uh, you know, 19 years old, in fact. So uh, I've been involved in Red Art for, for 20 years as a member of staff, as Joe said, and as, as a trustee. Um, and then my current role, I found basically because, and this is often the way things go in the humanitarian aid sector, basically because I met the founder of an organization called Field Ready um, at a Red Art trustee meeting. Um, I've been the chief executive of Engineers Without Borders UK. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that organization. It's doing fantastic work at the moment. Um, and that really helped me um, uh, understand the development sector a lot better. Um, but I was always involved in Red R. Um, one of the ways of thinking about the skills that you need, this is me, <laughs> uh, back in the 1986 uh, uh, hurricane that hit London. Um, one of the things, ways to think about what you can get from or what you can bring to um, humanitarian relief work is essentially uh, head, hand, and heart. And I have to say, um, even though you know I really do quite like doing things with my hands, that's one of the appealing things about humanitarian relief. You get to use your hand a lot, uh, making things, um, doing things. Um, really, I see my role as being very much about using um, my head as a, um, a graduate engineer. And um, uh, I think that the heart stuff is sort of implicit, but I, I have to say that um, that comes more from, you know, the joy of working with the people that you meet in the aid sector. So I see a lot of my work uh, my role in the aid sector is about creating opportunities for local people. And the video I'm about to play you was recently broadcast on Fiji and national television. And it's a summary of a program that I was able to set up because, well, quite frankly, I was um, uh, in a position to use my head and my you know, understanding of the sector and my experience of aid from Rhode Island elsewhere to eventually apply for a, a large grant uh, from the Australian government to do risk reduction work, uh, innovation work in Fiji. And um, so this is a really good example of what I mean about my role has been about creating opportunities for others um, to use their heads, hands and hearts as well. So here's uh, the video. Today in our local tech, we showcase how technology can be used to empower people. Feel Ready Pacific came to Fiji last year, so it's going on to two years now. Our slogan is humanitarian supplies made in the field. So that basically means we make the humanitarian supplies when and wherever it's needed. So we bring in our tools, the technologies we have, and using the local resources, we engage the community as well to making those humanitarian supplies. This could be anything. This could be basically shelter, or like we have the latrines, and we also have the better buckets 
those better buckets are also distributed. Other ones is the food operated tap that we design in the office and we distribute it to hospitals. We also have the face shield. We prototyped it using a 3D printer. Um, and we have the no hands doorknob where we attach this 3D printed um, device onto the door, a doorknob, and we use our elbow to open the door. This is because of this pandemic and distributing it to the hospitals as well. So this is our 3D printer here. So currently we're printing a face shield prototype. So what, what 3D printing helps us to do is like we have various designs coming up, right? So maybe one engineer has a certain type of design and the other one has a different type of design. So what we can do is like prototype those design on a small scale and then test it out. So that's how 3D printing helped us to develop like different types of face shields. So what we did is made different prototypes and have like healthcare personnel test them and like agree to which design they would prefer the best. So once that is done, we could like develop more parts using our laser cutter. So this is a slow process and laser cutter is a fast process. So that would take about an hour to print, whereas in an hour we would get about 100 of these in the laser cutter. We look at the humanitarian needs in the most challenging geographical places in Fiji, uh, mainly the rural areas uh, where we see that uh, the community is missing something. They're far away from the resources that's available in the city. And we try to be innovative with our skills. We have electrical engineers, we have mechanical engineers in the office. And we work together, collaborating what we know to come up with ideas of uh, making technologies that would meet the humanitarian needs uh, in a faster, cheaper, and better way. And to all the young viewers who are watching, my advice would be, if you have a dream, just stick with it, work hard. It's all just about consistency and having faith that you can do it. And anything is possible if you put your whole heart into it. Thank you. So you heard from uh, my uh, colleague, Lisa there, an excellent um, engineer in PG. Um, we have some advice actually at the end there about uh, working as um, an engineer in the humanitarian. I think there is um, huge, uh, a huge importance placed on um, you know working with local people and, and um, important roles for people like me. You know, being educated in uh, the UK and the skills that I can bring, the connections that I can bring um, to, to make these things happen, and create these opportunities. But I think there is a real challenge about the role of an engineer and the way that we have almost been trained in this country to think uh, that we need to overcome if we're going to be effective. One of the things that, one of the stories I'd like to tell, this is from Vanuatu in the South Pacific, um, where uh, the island of Ambar was evacuated because of a volcanic eruption. One of the things I'd like to quickly describe is basically um, we did an, uh, an assessment of an evacuation center where um, uh, all of the, you know, disabled people, uh, old age people, pregnant women, the most vulnerable people were put into what was essentially a brand new unfurnished cruise ship terminal, a uh, collective center to, so that they could receive care. But there wasn't any furniture in there. So the aid agency spent quite a lot of time and money trying to figure out how to um, buy furniture and import furniture and so on. What um, my colleague Addy in the centre here and the local hardware store did was rather than think about defining the problem is let's get some furniture, let's let's find beds for these people to sleep on so they can you know stand themselves up without volunteer assistance. Um, maybe we just need to find a way so that they're not sleeping on the floor. So changing the definition of the engineer's role from you know providing beds to help people not sleep on the floor. And that simple design choice meant that we could work with the local hardware store. We actually just borrowed materials. We didn't even use the material, buy the materials. We borrowed the materials for six weeks whilst the evacu evacuation center was open. And we made uh, temporary um, beds for everyone to sleep on. And uh, this was a, a fantastic success.
less, and actually meant a lot of people were able to um, uh, to get up in the night to, to take care of themselves without depending on volunteers. It made a big difference, but we have to change the frame of the brief that was given to the engineers. We're not there as engineers to provide the answers all the time, but it's about asking the right questions. And so it's also about bringing global expertise. And this is something that um, a good friend of mine, Joanne Deal, um, presented when she was um, doing work um, at Coventry University and the World Assembly of Engineering and Engineering for that borders. University tells you, you know, that problems are, that have a right or wrong answer, you can check your answers. The problems have very little context. When you study engineering, you're, you're in that column on the left. In real life, it's just often not the case that there is a right and wrong answer, that, um, that you can be confident in um, your solution. You have to be confident in yourself in your solution. And projects actually really do affect people. So I started thinking of humanitarian engineering as a lens through which um, we can learn so much more about um, what it means to be an engineer and to transition um, from being sort of a fairly typical university graduate who's been trained to think in a, in a particular way into being far more effective engineers in industry, even in our own country, by gaining experience of humanitarian work, that we can move between these um, different paradigms that we face as engineers every day, I think. One of the um, big learnings I've had uh, is when to think linearly and when to think non-linearly. <laughs> Engineers are trained to think in linear terms. And if you look at this Kinevin framework, which I would encourage you to, to look up, um, we're look, basically trained to think in terms of the right-hand side when things are simple and complicated, but they're repeatable. Um, you know, you do the same thing twice to get the same result. Nobody, you know, nobody wants a structure, a building that isn't going to be predictable, right? So we are trained in that right-hand side of um, the picture here. But actually, the world, reality, is non-linear. It's complex. It's chaotic. You do the same thing twice in different locations, or even in the same location twice, different people, you get different results. The situation's always changing. So the thing about humanitarian engineering for me is that I think it's made me a better engineer because it's helped me to embrace complexity and to meet the world as it is on its own terms, rather than always trying to linearize it and make it something that typical um, engineering thinking uh, would normally be able to um, analyze and um, repeat. So um, I want to wish you uh, very good luck. Um, I think a lot of the, um, the, the wonderful thing about being a humanitarian engineer is the amazing people that you meet, and um, you know, in, in, in the banter affected community, other aid workers, um, but also you know the amazing places you get to, to uh, get to see in a better understanding of these other um, cultures, and to help you sort of think beyond the borders of uh, the engineering education, perhaps. Yeah, you know, we've all all gone through. So um, yeah, very good luck, and uh, you know, I just want to say how grateful I am to Red Art um, over the last 20 years of, of being there and helping me um, progress my career in humanitarian engineering. And I think that's it from me. Back to you, Joe. Thanks, Andrew, and yeah, happy to have been working alongside you all these years. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to hand over to Richard, and again, another person who I've worked alongside for many years. Uh, Richard, I worked at DFID, and Richard worked at DFID before me, working in the, in the operations team there. And I have seconded Richard probably many occasions into the UN, UN to work as a water sanitation and hygiene um, wash uh, cluster coordinator, um, and also worked alongside him in um, Cyclone Siddha in Bangladesh in 2007. So again, a, a long history. So over to Andrew. I oh, will just also a random reminder. Please do remember to put your questions in on just because we're going to have the Q and A session directly after um, Richard's speech. Great. Thanks so much, Joe. 
Uh, I'm, good afternoon or greetings to you if you're uh, outside of Europe. I'm really pleased to be here today and have a chance to speak uh, with you all. Um, I'm a humanitarian consultant, but I, um, I work a lot in the water and sanitation hygiene field and also to some extent to shelter. Um, I thought it might be useful just to give you a little bit of a, a resume of my journey, my story. Um, it's not necessarily typical in terms of uh, conventional engineering, but it might be illustrative of, of how I got to where I've got to. So I did my degree, uh, undergraduate degree at University College London in 1982, and I started life working for John Molam uh, in the Isle of Dogs in 1982 in, in London, uh, working in construction. And then for the period of uh, up to 1988, I worked in commercial construction and, and traveled uh, abroad under my, own, uh, under my own steam. Then from the period 1988 to 2007, I worked uh, most of that time for, for Oxfam. I went back and uh, studied a master's in 1991. And then in 2000, I, uh, I've got, I became a chartered engineer. Uh, so it's Institute of Water and Environmental Management. And it, over that period, I've worked for DFID, as Joe noted, for a, a year and a half, uh, UNICEF for over three years, and I've been a humanitarian consultant since 2010. Now, I, I, for me, I, I always had a, a, a aspiration, I would say a determination to be an engineer as a child. My, my father was an engineer. Um, but it, I had certain tendencies, certain characteristics even then. But it was attending a talk in 1982 in my final year uh, when um, it, it was probably Peter Guthrie, uh, the founder of Red R, who spoke. And that really inspired me. And I, I knew at that point that I wanted to, to take my uh, engineering uh, aspirations and uh, apply them, work internationally and, and work in service of people. And so the, the sort of characteristics I've outlined there, that being clear thinking, pragmatic, determined, and risk-taking, and dealing with complexity, those those aspects have definitely been honed through my work as an engineer commercially in the 80s in the UK, and then subsequently in my work internationally. I just wanted to move on to the ethics of doing good, the, the really useful guide that the Institute of Structural Engineers has produced that's on the website uh, has a section on the ethics of doing good. And I've outlined some qualities, some of the soft skills that I think are really so important. And I want you to bear in mind that working internationally, you're working cross-culturally, you're working with new people, and it's a very dynamic situation. So these soft skills are so critical. Um, and it's, for me, in order to be able to demonstrate these qualities is so powerful because of the, the, the obstacles, the barriers we're having to transcend from being in unfamiliar situations. And I, my experience really has shown me that by carrying, having this deep integrity and carrying these qualities, you you speak with deep authenticity, and this is this is from the heart, not the head. This is feeling it, living it, rather than thinking it, and that builds trust, which is is so critical when you're working with um, people right across the world in in highly stressful situations. So moving on to the learning journey, learning about international development, humanitarian response. Um, what I would, what my advice to you on this is, I, I, I had to go back and and do a master's course after having uh, worked for a year for Oxfam. In a sense, I went back as a mature student with a whole different perspective and and really had to relearn the things I probably should have learned in my first degree. Um, the motivation was there for me in a very different way. The second point of knowing enough about everything, uh, you're often working in situations where you are without much support, although in this day and age with uh, connectivity, this is uh, less true. But nonetheless, the ability to have a really broad span of knowledge. Um, and so you might be might well be called upon to, to uh, comment advice on things outside of your direct 
experience. So having a good spread of, of, of knowledge to know enough about everything then to be able to learn to apply your expertise pragmatically. I mean, uh, uh, Andrew alluded to this. It's these complex situations that we and chaotic situations we face. And we are so often working in far from uh, perfect conditions where our engineered and designed solutions simply can't be achieved in, at the outset. We may work towards those. So the ability to be pragmatic. I think I, I there's something really powerful about learning through scenarios and simulations and uh, radar uh, is excellent on, on these things. And these are the sorts of uh, applied situations that certainly in my degree at university, I didn't get much exposure to. So learn about yourself through scenarios and simulations. Really important, of course, to understand other cultures and, and countries and to be able to expose yourself and immerse yourself in those situations. And the last point here about learning, uh, get a mentor. Uh, I, I went to, I found that I, when I got a mentor for to become a chartered engineer, this is extremely uh, important, but I'd really recommend getting a mentor. Just thinking then about the relevant experience. For me, working in construction was incredibly powerful. I, I learnt so much more than in my degree, which was a rather theoretical degree. And and many people, many engineers who go into uh, uh, human work and development work come from a consulting background. But my own journey was with construction, and that was incredibly useful because of the sort of the pressures, the very dynamic situation you're working in. I applied to VSO and was unsuccessful in 1983. I was accepted by Red R in 1985, and and then I was writing letters. So the key point here is, is perseverance. If you're if you're really determined to do this, that perseverance. And then I had an opportunity at the Red R AGM in 1988 uh, to start work with Oxfam in Ethiopia. A brief comment about uh, the the relevance of a master's compared to being a chartered engineer. And this is in the context if you want to devote yourself to working in the uh, humanitarian or development sectors, um, a lot more attention is paid on on the masters. It, I, I've never seen applications for work with UN or international NGOs or Red Cross focusing on being a chartered engineer. It's not to say I think it's really important but uh, a master's seems to be much more important. And a, a note about working for a modest income. I mean, there are some agencies like Medicine Sans Frontieres, the, the, particularly the francophone organizations that offer more modest remuneration, but can be a first step up. And I'd also encourage you to be, if you're, if you're determined to be opportunistic, to look for opportunities, particularly at times of uh, major crisis, there might be there might be opportunities to offer yourself up in support. And I finally wanted to, just to get you to think about your expectations out of this. Are you looking for this as, as a career or occasional work so you would step away from your your commercial work uh, in, in the UK and Europe? So there's a key decision there. And really a, an important point to stress, it's a long shot. There are a lot less opportunities now than I, when I started. So um, it's unlikely there's a lot more emphasis rightly on national staff. So, And it has certainly become a lot more about behind the computer in meetings. Also, uh, really, organizations becoming have become so much more bureaucratic. So prepare yourself for these, uh, these aspects too. And remember, in, in disasters, uh, you might be exposed to huge hardship and, and human suffering. And then the final point, uh, going back to this idea of this, the soft skills, you know, this is not about, this is not about ego. This is about having a heroic co uh, conviction, but with real humility. On that note, I'll hand you back to Joe. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Richard. I think that was brilliant and actually kind of sings to some of the questions that we've got coming through now. Um, so I think I'll just switch to take some of those. Um, you may have already answered some of those. So we have one from Amy Allen. This is, what is the best way for a student to get involved in humanitarian engineering work, especially during COVID-19? Um, maybe, Richard, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um I think uh, I mean Andrew talked about uh, volunteering. I, I think route, routes to volunteering is a powerful way to get connected with something. Um, so I'd recommend uh, volunteering. Obviously, there are training courses uh, around. There's so much available uh, that can be undertaken remotely. So that's another good way to to connect. Um, and as I noted, that some of those francophone organisations uh, for people perhaps in their mid uh, 20s is that they can provide opportunities that some of the sort of the Anglo-Saxon organizations and the UN don't provide. Great. Thanks, Richard. Um, so let's take another question here. So a lot has been said about this is from Brian Reed about soft skills. Um, are the, and, we can, and, and then also there's another question about soft skills a bit further on. You know, are the technical solutions in a humanitarian response the same as in a UK, in the UK? And how can I learn more about the soft skills needed for humanitarian response? Um, maybe I'll ask Andrew to answer that one. Yeah, thanks. And, um, and actually, just on the previous question, if you are currently doing an undergraduate degree, um, uh, you know, with an ambition to work with an NGO, try and make your final year project, your degree project, on the topic of a humanitarian um, issue of some kind, a humanitarian challenge of some kind. But, and, you know, partner, try and, you know, reach out to people within the sector, um, within the humanitarian sector, including myself. You know, you, my email address is up there earlier. Um, to see, um, if you, uh, if you can, you know, if there's some way that you can add that. Doing it as part of your degree, um, you know, even if it is sort of a research project done from uh, your COVID safe, university uh, bedroom. Um, I think that, you know, that, that's a good way um, to do it. I've seen a lot of people get involved in the sector by, by doing it as part of their degree and proposing their own final year project instead of, um, uh, you know, working on the ones that the university provides. I, th I would say that to answer the question about are the technical solutions in the humanitarian response the same as in the UK, the in the UK uh, Yes and no. So the uh, the constraints are very different, um, and um, the the assumptions that one might be able to make as a practicing engineer are, um, you know, in the UK <laughs> are very different to the assumptions that you you, you might. Uh, be able to make in a uh, disaster relief context. So, for, you know, a, a silly example. Um, if you order material of a certain dimension, let's say, wood of uh, one meter long, in a developing country context, there is a huge difference between ordering wood of one meter and ordering wood of one point north north meters. So, if you assume that you know you're ordering wood of one meter. Uh, and you, that you're going to get with a one meter, you're going to be unsuccessful because there's a big difference between, you know, you're going to get wood any, anywhere between 50 centimeters and 150 centimeters because it's about, it's about a meter long, right? But 1.0 north, north is a very different question. Whereas in the UK, you would assume, you would make an assumption that if you order wood of less than one meter, you get wood that long. The constraints are very different. So, um, power, Connectivity, the ability to look things up, the ability to ask colleagues. You may be the only qualified um, engineer in your organization, um, in the field. And, um, this is where Red Art Services like Knowledge Point become very helpful because you can talk about a qualified engineer. I would say the other, um, thing that comes to mind here is that practicing as an engineer in a disaster context, I mean, if I may say so, is a lot more challenging from a professional perspective because essentially 
it, 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 you are the one that is um, individually accountable. You don't necessarily have a large engineering team around you where the team would take that uh, collective accountability for the engineering work. So I would say the professional demand on military engineers are a, a, a lot higher. Um, I, I hope that's a reasonably um, direct question, direct answer to that question. But I think on the on the you know the second part of it, how do you learn those soft skills? I think it is um, uh, the, the mentoring and the experience, but then also just looking at people, um, you know, like Richard here today, that sort of um, inspire you and hearing hearing their stories and learning from them and you know, working with a mentor that um, you can learn those skills. It, it is an experience, uh, experiential learning, I think. Great. Thanks to both of you. And um, I think, as, as Andrew just said, you know, it's about working with people and, and it's something that, you know, is coming more and more to the fore and probably arguably should have been done a long while ago is around communication, uh, community engagement. And that's about accountability to affected populations. And so, whereas uh, in the past you may have had a water and sanitation engineer uh, who is more focused on the technical skills, it is now a more about uh, having both of those, including those soft skills and being able to engage with the communities so that they are involved in a response. Um, so I've got a couple of other questions here as well. Um, some of them are linked. So some we've talked a bit about localization and what that means um, and that it's now less appropriate to deploy um, you know people overseas and that actually we're looking at building capacity in the field so um, how can engineers support in a local context i.e not deploying but supporting national and local en engineers um, is that something that and then also there's one from lauren barnes from arab here how do you assess the appropriateness for western engineers to be involved in projects in the wider world so they're kind of linked really it's saying you know we, we we're in a world of localization how appropriate is it for western engineers to be involved in projects in the wider world um uh andrew or richard andrew do you want to take that one yeah i think you can do a lot remotely now um my colleague uh, at Field Ready, Bryn, Bryn Moore John, his name is, a uh, solid Welsh engineer. He, um, uh, he, he, he does a lot of work, um, essentially from the Fab Lab, the maker space in Cardiff, and provides, um, assistance remotely to engineers in the field. He does occasionally go on trips, um, out into the field. The reason we hired him is because he approached us after doing a Red R course, and a member of Red R staff actually uh, suggested he reach out to to feel ready, and we were in need of an engineer at the time. But yeah, he does. It's, it's a, a little bit like what you said, Richard. Um, there's a lot of desk work, uh, but, that, but every now and again you get, you get to go out and meet people. I think there's, there's a lot more potential for that. The um, the I mean, how can engineers support in the local context? I really think it's about bringing in the skills and expertise, not even the resources. It can even be you might have to access to software that the local engineers just don't have. That actually can, can be quite powerful as well. You know, those those sorts of things are, um, uh, are the ways that you know field ready international staff, as it were, are supporting local engineers. Richard. Yeah, so I think you've talked about the backstopping. Um, probably the point I wanted to highlight is that so much is about context and feeling what a situation looks like. And it, it, unless you've been there, it's hard to get up there to knowledge. And I think bringing that technical support and backstopping and then those that they're speaking to are on the spot and from that, that, that country will understand be able to grasp the context and apply it so i think that uh it's to adopt a support have a supporting role mentality to to be there to give to gift if you like your your knowledge and then to leave those individuals to apply that appropriately is really important and, and that's about the soft skills that we've we've talked about so much thanks 
great. So we've probably got time for a couple more questions. There is a question here linked to the localization, and this is from Dom Coz, uh, and it's many NGOs in developing countries pay no tax in the host country, lead lavish lifestyles, purchase fleets of shiny gas-guzzling SUVs, and pay the local staff less than they themselves earn in an hour. Are you at all concerned that the proportion of aid cash that is actually spent on the ground is so low? Um, that's one of the tricky uh, tricky questions. Um, again, I will ask um, Richard or uh, Andrew to answer that one. Yeah, I, so I, I, when I started with Oxfam, um, Oxfam comes from a Quaker Quaker roots, and uh, when I started in the late eighties, it was I described a much more um, humble organization, um, modest in its expenditure and so forth. And I, I watched uh, as various things changed and uh, safety and security, more and more international staff and national staff at risk from direct attack. So it costs to all the security investments. I also watched these organizations becoming more professional, you know, from UN, Red Cross, Red Crescent, INGOs, uh, becoming more professional, uh, higher expectations. There was, a, after the Great Lakes crisis in the 90s, there was a lot of attention on the staff care aspects. So we started to see more expenditure on all of that. So the costs to, for all these organizations to, to run themselves increased over time. Um, yeah, and we're left with a situation in which it is much more costly to mobilize these organizations. In a sense, I, I feel that personal behavior is so important to set the tone um, and having that humility uh, that doesn't determine what an organization gives and spends money on. But I said there's some good drivers for, for this. Uh, so it's a complex, it's a complex question. But that's, I hope that's some answer. Great, Richard. I'm actually going to move on quickly. We've got two more. We've got some lots more late questions coming in. Um, so there's an I from Asim Malik. I'm an engineer mainly helping in charities on water and solar in Africa. I'm very much interested in borehole courses, which Red Arm runs with university. Can I expect this course running in the future? Um, yes, hopefully. It is one of our... Uh, brilliant courses and uh, one of our technical courses um yes we do hope it will running in future covid obviously um permitting and allowing us to take that forward um there was another question here about quick, a quick question dear joe andrew richard can each of you recommend a book so my first recommendation is engineering in emergencies uh, that is a bible to many engineers working in humanitarian emergencies quickly richard um oh I, I would read donut economics something entirely disconnected from engineering but that's really important because we are working in a world where we have to consider much wider than the disaster immediate disaster great quickly Andrew. Um, <laughs> managing humanitarian innovation um which uh talks about new ways of working and complements the Linear training we've had as engineers with new non-linear ways of working. Great, thank you. Sorry, guys, that we didn't have a chance to answer all of your questions. I hope you got some really good ideas now about uh, the links between engineering and the humanitarian world. And I wish you all that success or um, and a lovely, lovely day. We're now going to go over to a video which is um, was basically was drawn up by or was made by Arab and their partners, and they put together a short video with some of their partners in the humanitarian field about the skills that engineers need for working in these contexts. So thanks to iStraxi, thanks to Julia uh, for the introduction, thanks to Andrew and Richard and the people behind the scenes um, over to the Arab video. Thank you. I think most important things for me is to um, how to move my experience for the for the other staffs and engineers by 
two things uh, how to be patient in the project and and how to be active uh, patient with your problems with your issue and active how to solve it with a very good way uh, to make the work going uh, smoothly suggest the most important skills for engineers working in a tech environment are probably not actually the technical skills but it's more the coordination uh, communication and flexibility or adaptability to deal with different situations and um, working with people who maybe are not technical in quite a kind of fast changing, sometimes informal environment. Having said that, having a good technical grounding is quite important because it gives you confidence and ability to adapt to new situations where there aren't necessarily good design codes or guidance. It's, it's quite an interesting job. I mean, in the last two years working here, I've worked extensively with bamboo, uh, which is a material I've never used before. And obviously I'm far, far from an expert, but I never really thought that I would be producing design guidance on how to use bamboo or build uh, bamboo palisades or retaining structures. International organization should build up the capacity of the local organization by increasing the training workshop and even time-based staff exchange to make the local partner able to handle and deliver high quality projects with more efficiency. An important skill is to be able to think holistically. Often we like to silo issues. I've worked on projects that are looking to reconstruct after a flood and sort of forget that the region is also seismic. Or when you're working on a construction project, well, that can also be viewed as an economic opportunity for the local area and it can build on livelihood for women and it can reduce embodied carbon and be fully accessible and then you're really talking. I would also suggest that with more kind of climate-based work and increased risks, it's good, well, it's necessary that there is more focus on design and safety and with uh, increasing kind of needs around the world, resources need to be spent kind of efficiently. So um, work needs to be cost effective because any money wasted in one place is money that's not being spent to help people who need it somewhere else. We need to go in fully aware of the impact of Western frame practices, of power dynamics, of bias and the profiling that happens we need to be continually asking ourselves these difficult and uncomfortable questions you know is the language that's been used appropriate am i taking up space that should be someone else's um you know are the right people at the table or in this email chain or on this zoom call um you know and are they not just being consulted but are they actually leading and making the decisions the technology uh, that we lived uh, in now it's going uh, faster and faster so we can uh, do that with uh, make this technology uh, serve our uh, engineers serve our staffs to uh, develop the projects to uh, manage the projects in a, a very uh, good way and uh, this can serve uh, the population, the countries, all areas. So as we reach a developmental tipping point, the impacts of climate change and other global challenges are becoming increasingly obvious. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted that there's no place or community which is immune from these potential impacts. We all need to improve our ability to adapt to and recover from these rapidly changing issues. And now more than ever, there's a need for humanitarian engineering in all aspects of our work through the built environment to tackle this issue of sustainable development and build resilience. In partnering with organizations like Red R, we expand the reach and effectiveness of our work and in turn, support and amplify the work that they do, which creates further impact. The need for and value of these trusted partnerships has never been so important to us.